Yes, Jane, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm talking to you. How's it going? Uh, it's going quite well. I'm here with uh, Kia Sphinx, and uh, we're doing fine. Oh, good, good, good. Well, yeah, I want to just say once again, you did a great job. I think it was March of uh, this year, um, uh, putting forth your view of the whole scenario. But I just wanted to tee up uh, the fact pattern uh, that led to the lawsuit. Uh, back in February, there were two uh, accusers, and I want to stress that uh, the lieutenant governor uh, adamantly uh, contests the allegations. He's taken a lie detector test and passed, and they made two allegations. One was from Meredith Watson, who was at Duke University, and the other was uh, by Dr. Vanessa Tyson. So, uh, Lauren, could you or and or Kia um, just go through... Uh, when the lawsuit was filed, uh, who are the defendants, and what are the claims in the lawsuit? And then I want to get into some of the weeds in your amended complaint. Sure, sure, Jean. The lawsuit was filed on September 12th. Uh, then there was an amended complaint on October 3rd where we added some text messages that I sent to CBS specifically to their political reporter, Ed O'Keefe, where I told him uh, I effectively sent him four names on, on February 8th. 2019, the day that Ms. Watson came out with her allegation, or her attorney came out with Ms. Watson's allegation. And in those text messages are the names of people who could have told CBS in that moment that the story from Ms. Watson was false, including their own counsel sitting in-house at CBS News and an eyewitness whose room this alleged encounter happened in. So CBS, having not followed up uh, with those four people, did not find out what the truth was on that day, on February 8th. But as the months went by, we were communicating, of course, with CBS quite a lot. And uh, Justin's attorney, Barry Pollack, you might know, on July 9th, communicated um, to the district attorney, Satana DeBerry, in uh, Durham, North Carolina, that Justin wanted the criminal investigation, which Justin had been saying since day one. And in that communication to the DA, uh, Barry Pollock outlines that there was another person involved, a third person that Ms. Watson completely left out of her story, uh, and also that there was a attorney at CBS who knew the story who had dated Ms. Watson back in 2000. So with all of those facts, uh, we believe we uh, arrive at the uh, standard, uh, the malice standard, for, uh, which is reckless disregard for the truth that is outlined in New York Times' Reese Sullivan, uh, which, of course, is a higher standard for public officials, but... That and the fact that Ms. Tyson, of course, had been investigated thoroughly by the Washington Post, who, of course, dropped her story. And you, of course, probably know the backstory with regard to the way Ms. Tyson's story came to light through Adria Shaw, friend of uh, LeVar Stoney, who, of course, is married to LeVar Stoney's former aide. Um, and, in fact, uh, you know, Ms. Tyson uh, has talked very extensively about the fact that she's a victim of incest uh, over the 20 years, uh, over at least 20 years. And had never mentioned anything about an encounter when she was 28 years old at the DNC with a 25-year-old. We, of course, thought that was extremely unusual, and I think the Washington Post thought so as well, which is why they dropped the story. So I think the justice case easily makes it to the standard uh, that is required for elected officials. Well, let me ask you this, Lauren. Going back to the Washington Post, do they state that uh, – your office or the lieutenant governor made a statement that the Washington Post had cleared him. Uh, that wasn't entirely accurate. Would you agree? I don't think that we've ever heard of anything with regards to the Washington Post making a statement that he was cleared. What we know is that Miss uh, the attorney for Miss Watson, Nancy Erica Smith, has not uh, vouched for Miss Watson's story since July 9 when it was revealed that Ms. Watson left out an entire human being uh, with this alleged encounter that she's alleging in 2000 against Justin. So when that happened and Ms. Watson's attorney went dead silent, which she's been silent now since July 9, and not vouching for her client's story, which, as you know, as an attorney, Jean, she cannot necessarily come out and say anything negative about her attorney. Right. But see, we've never said anything about the Washington Post clearing us. Okay. We've only said that Ms. Watson's attorney has not vouched for her own client's story since July 9th. Well, let me just get to, uh, there's a document um, that is part of the docket sheet. And for those who are listening, uh, by the way, if you want to call in to ask any of us questions, 
Dial 804-778-8888, 804-778-8888. You can listen live at WJFNRadio.com. The uh, CBS Corporation and CBS Broadcasting, Inc., the two defendants, they filed uh, Document 17. It's November 1st of this year. And they filed a motion to dismiss. And, and essentially they're saying, it's a long motion, by the way, in memo, Essentially, they're saying that all they did, all CBS at all did, was put a camera in front of um, Dr. Vanessa Tyson and put a camera in front of Meredith Watson and let them give their story. And what the CBS defendants are saying is that that by itself is not grounds for defamation. So what's your argument against that one, if you're able to say? Well, yeah, I'm able to say. So there was new information in that interview on uh, April 1 and 2. Uh, so you, you had the fact that, for, for example, we didn't even see Ms. Watson at all. You know, remember that on, on the day that her allegation came out, it was a piece of paper from her attorney that ended something like, I will never speak with this on this publicly again or something. So then Ms. Watson, of course, gets on CBS News and tells this story heard for the first time uh, about, you know, aggressive premeditated behavior and standing in doorways and being forced to do things. Um, so that was a original, uh, that was an original piece of information. You'll also notice, too, with Ms. Tyson's interview that she is not at any point in that interview uh, – saying that she's ever said no or stop or anything else. And actually, Gail King asked her specifically, did you say anything to indicate that you were not happy with what was going on? She has, of course, five consents in front of that. When we get into the details of what she's saying, that was the real, that was actually in contradiction to what she put out as a statement. But Lauren, let me focus on that. Yeah. Is, is uh, Gail King's question actually harmful to you? Because it goes against the argument that there was reckless disregard and malice because Gail King is asking a question that a cross-examiner in a trial would ask. Well, but Gail King and CBS at that point already knew uh, a certain amount of facts that they should have asked during these interviews that they failed to ask, and then they knew it again on July 9, and then they knew it again in August when we're telling them in the background exactly what happened and they're not reporting it. So you'll notice that, you know, when the July 9 letters come out where Justin is requesting criminal investigations, all these other news organizations reported that. They said, look, you know, uh, the attorney, the uh, le lieutenant governor is alleging that there's a second person and that there's an attorney at CBS News who knew the story was false. And everyone reported that except CBS. So CBS just goes silent. And we're in the background with CBS telling them and asking them, are you going to update your story to at least say, look, you know, we have these other facts. So I think that their, their, their reckless disregard, their malice and reckless disregard for the truth in this story is seen in them willfully not trying to report the full story, which is really, really seen after July 9, after you see publicly the letters that came out that went to the two district attorneys in Boston and North Carolina. So... Um, I get the argument that we often hear about, well, all CBS did was just put people on to be interviewed. But you, there's a duty, there's an obligation for news organizations to check the facts of things before they just put people on the air, Gene. And that's why you saw that ABC and NBC and CNN did not interview them, because those news organizations have different standards. And as somebody who worked at ABC News for four years, I can tell you the standards are a lot higher than they were at CBS. So, so, so okay. Lauren, just so I'm clear, and, and I want to get to Key in a minute. And get, mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying, Lauren, your major argument is that they had a duty uh, of due di they had to due diligence duty to make sure that this was not a total fabrication. You know, somebody says that Gene Rossi robbed 40 banks and stole five million dollars. You can't right. just put somebody on TV to say that. You got to do some due diligence to see if this person uh, is corroborated or has uh, made inconsistent statements in the past. But but just for the listeners, because it's been a while for 